I am so happy to have someone with Bryn's background advising us. When I was here, we didn't even have a full-time placement office. Sorry, a full-time placement office. But I worked for Dean Pounds and changed that and became the first director of placement. That's another story. We are just... My, um, Bryn has been here since 2006. Before that, she worked for other international and graduate business school education, and we won't quiz her on which one she worked for in case it was across the river. She, <laughs> she is dedicated alumni career advisor and works with MIT Sloan graduates to provide guidance related to job search strategy, positioning oneself on cover letters and LinkedIn, networking, and positioning Sloanies. We're a unique bunch, right? <laughs> We're not the usual, so I think this is really important for us. I attended her webinar on this same subject and came back for a second dip because it so changed my view of LinkedIn. So I hope you enjoy her today. She will discuss how to effectively leverage LinkedIn's many features to maximizing your networking, your opportunities, conduct research, stay current on industry trends, and optimize your overall career management strategy. Optimize, we, we understand that word here. So please join me in welcoming Bryn Panay. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Reunion. So excited to see you. It's my favorite time of year because everybody's happy. It's so fun to see old faces. I used to run recruiting um, when the class of 2008 was here, so that's probably where you might see me. It's fun to see some, some folks. But since then, I have transitioned over to the advising side of the house, which is a great fit for me. How many people were in my first session this morning around positioning? Oh, good, so you came back. Good. Uh, well, so this morning was very strategic. It, we really talked about how do you want to think about positioning yourself for an eventual career move? how to assess your strengths and be able to drill down on those strengths, how to think about what you need and want at this particular age and stage of your career. We did some work around values, which was pretty cool, and then we talked about putting into a narrative. So I had said this session this afternoon is much more tactical. We're really talking about LinkedIn. It's a complete game changer in terms of how you uh, want to manage your career, but we will talk about how to position yourself via LinkedIn, and it'll be kind of a nice um, capstone to this morning's session for those of you who aren't here. So, all right, let's get started. I'm going to try and make you power users of LinkedIn by 5:30. I always run to the end of this session, so I will take questions as we go. But there's a lot to cover. All right. Let me ask. First of all, how many of you are regularly on LinkedIn? You you use it pretty actively. Okay, great. So that's good. So nobody is anybody not on LinkedIn at all, and this is like brand new. Okay. So five years ago when I started doing this workshop, at least half the people in the room would raise their hand. Now, we know it's much more prolific. Anybody use it to look for a job? Yep. Anybody get tapped by recruiters who said, I saw your profile and I want to talk to you, okay? Anybody use it to source business development um, or sales leads, investing for your company? Awesome, okay. Um, and what else can you use it for? LinkedIn can be used for everything. I think that's about, I think that's all of it. Okay, all these things, tremendous tool. LinkedIn is a tremendous tool. So where I want to start, as I said, it's a game changer. And when used optimally, it can be transformative for how you manage your career, primarily for two reasons. So first of all, it's an incredibly powerful platform to use to both build and manage your network. Right? There are no more Rolodexes. Remember those days where you had these huge Rolodexes on your desk and you those don't exist anymore, right? So it's, it, is your, it is your new networking Rolodex. But second, and maybe more importantly, LinkedIn is now used by executive search firms and companies of all sizes to effectively find talent. Okay? So we know that companies of all sizes, small startups, Huge multinational firms are using LinkedIn effectively to hire, okay? They're using a, a search tool called Talent Solutions, right? And they're looking for both passive and active talent. Now, when I say passive talent, I mean that these are people on LinkedIn who are not actively seeking jobs. So 
So if you're like me, you know, I have a LinkedIn profile, I'm not actively seeking a job. Oh no, my LinkedIn went, but we'll see. Um, I'm not actively seeking a job, but isn't it always nice to get tapped for your market value, right? It's always great to just check out those little pings that come in maybe from recruiters and looking at opportunities, right? Passive talent is actually attractive talent for most people, okay? So passive or active talent. So LinkedIn is a absolutely integral part of your career management nowadays, and it's critical if you are looking for a job, right? Let's take a look at LinkedIn these days. <coughs> So LinkedIn just turned 15 years old. It is now at the 562 million mark. So it hit the half billion mark last year. It's incredible growth for such a young company. It's incredibly international in scope. It's available in over 200 countries and territories in 24 languages. Pretty much the whole white collar US workforce is covered. I spoke with a product manager last year and he's like, we have nowhere to go. We're going international. So as you see, 70% of its membership right now is outside of the US. There are company pages, which we'll look at later today, over 20 million, great for companies to brand themselves and engage with followers. So we'll look at those two. Um, in 167 industries, right? Everything's covered. Four, Fortune 500 companies, most of them are clients. All the Fortune 100 companies are clients. One of the reasons I got so fascinated by LinkedIn I was attending the MIT Sloan Alumni Club of DC's event in like 2013, I don't know if anybody was there, and there was a panel of execs of search for, of talent executives, um, talent search executives, and the VP of talent acquisition for Northrop Grumman was there. So Northrop Grumman, large, huge global defense firm. And she sat in front of the whole room, it's like 80 people, and she said, you know, we pay about $5 million a year to LinkedIn and we source up to VP level talent. And I was just floored by that number at that time. Now I know banks are paying double that to find talent. But that's, that's the way that LinkedIn has changed the game, okay? So whether, it, and, and again, startups as well will use this too. They may not pay as much money, but they still get access to those recruiting tools, to those talent solution tools. And then the other stat I wanna call out here, oh, Sorry, the other side I want to call it here is the 60,000 school pages. So MIT and MIT Sloan have a school page. We're going to look at it later. Fantastic tool. You can literally find anyone on LinkedIn who's got MIT Sloan under the education section of their profile. You can slice and dice them by where they live, where they work, what they do, a keyword. Great for networking. Okay, so we'll take a look at that as well. The thing I want to mention is that LinkedIn says when you're thinking about who to connect with, who are your strongest connections? Typically, they come in for one of four buckets, okay? So first is your family and friends. Now, LinkedIn is a professional networking tool. It's not Facebook. However, your family and your friends have professional connections, and chances are they will tee up introductions to their professional connections should you need it. So it's okay to be connected with your, with your friends and your family on LinkedIn. Second, shared work experiences right, for the obvious reasons. These are your colleagues, so people that you've worked with in the past. Third, any community connections or volunteer affiliations you might have. So these are people you, who might be your neighbors or you go to, your, their kids go to your kids' school or you worship with or you play tennis with. And then fourth, can anybody guess? Bucket? Plus. Plus, thank you. So alumni affiliation. You guys are at this big networking party this weekend, right? So your alumni affiliations are another strong bucket, okay? And so what we always say in the career development office, those of you who hopefully remember, we say, build your network before you need it. Businesses are built on relationships. Your ability to move forward in your career is gonna be based on how well networked you are and the relationships that you have, right? And so LinkedIn gives you an extraordinarily powerful tool to do just that. All right, let's dive in to profiles. Does everybody have a LinkedIn checklist? No. No? Oh, can I have my colleagues in Ken? Sorry, my LinkedIn is not showing anymore. Oh, there we go. All right. <clears throat> and you might notice, those of you who are active on LinkedIn, they, they rolled out a new profile look. So this is all new within the last month. They've now moved the center profile pick to the side. Um, you know, I wonder if I should switch my screens. Would that be better? Probably. And to do that, I am going to, I know how to do this, I used to know. Display. I don't see 
see the switch screen? It doesn't say. Uh, you know what, I'm just gonna keep going and maybe you can switch my screen, is that okay? All right, so let's, so what we're gonna do, everybody has a checklist. Here's where we're gonna start. LinkedIn wants all of its users to meet their terms for having what they call an all-star profile. That's that little um, star over there. You'll see that on your profile, okay? They say that you're 40 times more likely to get viewed if you meet the criteria for having the all-star profile. That's the top part of the checklist, all right? Let's go through what those things are now. First, a professional looking photo, all right? We're gonna look at some photos in just a second. Here's my, here's my, but I don't want to distract you with gorgeous people until I tell you what I think you want on your photo, right? So here's a rule, recent, right? None of these, and I'm looking, I know, I see somebody who I've been telling her, update your photo for a while, because um, you don't have, you don't have that kind of hair. Um, photo, recent, smiling, right? You want to look friendly, first impressions count. And then you just need a photo from the neck up because you see how they crop, how they crop your picture now. You can see mine. You don't, it doesn't really even matter what you're wearing. And in the thumbnails, right, like look at that tiny little thumbnail there. It's so tiny. Like you don't want to have half a body shot. And you certainly don't want to have anybody else in your picture. Okay? This is not Facebook, right? So recent, smiling, people hire people who look friendly and approachable. So smile or at least, you know, can I make this joke? If you're European, half smile. Right? <laughs> Always looking their, looking their sternest, okay? All right, headline. So, your headline, most people use their job title, right? Because most people on LinkedIn are passive talent. So your job title's fine, or you can use a slogan, and I'm gonna show you that this in a second, that kind of creates a, you know, a unique value proposition. Or, if you're not that creative, you can also just use keywords. Some people will separate them with a pipe. Okay, so you wanna ask yourself, where do I add value and what's my industry? This headline is a signal about what you do. So you do wanna, can't just be very ambiguous. Let's look at some now. So here are two alums who have used the slogan approach. So Nick has global leader with expertise in finance and operations management. That is a template I will give people sometimes. Brand yourself with expertise in X and Y, or with success in X and Y, okay? So product manager, blockchain expert, whatever. And you know, the thing I would point out with this new uh, profile is that you get cut off. You know, you used to have the whole bandwidth to do it, so see how his little management kind of gets lost there? Just something to point out with that new um, profile look. And then Amy has leveraging data and analytics to grow revenue, create partnerships, and improve the customer experience. I will also point out these are excellent profile photos, right? Smiling, or at least kind of smiling. Um, you know, and you can see most of their face. The other piece I wanna point out, which I need to add to the checklist, even though it's not required for an all-star profile, I think what's really important is with this new profile rollout, you have all this space, you really wanna have a background photo. To not have it look <laughs> a little boring. So Amy's got the numbers, but I would encourage you to find a background photo that you know, gives an indication of your industry or maybe your function, or it should be professional. I wouldn't put pictures of people, I wouldn't put logos, I wouldn't put words, because those can be distracting, but I, like a nice visual, do that as well, okay? All right, so that's headline one, that's the slogan approach. This is the keyword approach. So Vuk has business strategy, FinTech, product management, okay, and he's got that that up and down line, which incidentally is the key over the enter key, if you hit control, okay? Erica, she's just used commas. I think it looks perfectly fine. And what I did like and why I selected these is because they made good space of this new um, layout. As you see, they keep on one line. I do think you should be thinking about that. So this headline is an important piece of real estate because when you come up in a search on the, recruiters, on the recruiter end of things, what comes up is this little business cardy top look. So you wanna make sure that people understand and have some context for what you do. Okay, any questions about that? I was gonna share some other slogans that people have used like 
big idea marketer with success in launching startups, executive advisor and investor in sustainable infrastructure and technology, making the difficult easy and the possible impossible. No, yeah, wait, wait a minute. And the impossible possible, right? That would be a better sell <laughs> in retail. That is a Sloan alum, but I will not give away the next. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. Um, so that's the headline. You know, I want to go back to one thing I missed, and that's why you want to have, like, the. I talked about the 40% more likely to come up if you have the all-star profile. But here's the other thing. I want you to think about it as, like, a Google search or other some other search engine you might use. <laughs> I don't know who doesn't use Google these days. Um, so if, like the rec on the recruiter side, if I am searching for people who went to MIT Sloan, who have lean manufacturing in their profile somewhere, who used to work for Boeing, right, or I'm going to get a queue of results. And those results are going to be ordered in terms of who's got a complete profile. So it really is important, not only 40 times more likely to come up, but you want to come to the top of any search you might do. So this is why it is important to hit those all-star profile fields. Okay. All right, that's headline. Moving on. Now we're, I think I'm going to dive into LinkedIn a little bit here. So other things that are important. Location and industry. They're now hidden. I'm just going to show you where to update those. With location, you want to put your current location. And I do recommend that you do the... Um, like the metropolitan area, right? So not Cambridge, Massachusetts, but greater Boston area, okay? Um, if you are moving and you know you're gonna move, you put your future location, right? Because this is one of the criteria that people will search on. So I went into edit profile at the very top. It gives me the option to edit all these lovely things. I come down and here's my country, my region, and the location. Now see, I put in my zip code I live in a tiny town north of here called Reading, Massachusetts. So it gives me the, op the option of doing Reading or Greater Boston. There are like zero businesses that would work for me in Reading, so Greater Boston is where I want to be, right? Same thing with the industry. This used to appear on your profile. It doesn't anymore. You do need to pick an industry. This is hu also hugely important if you're looking at coming up at on searches. So 167 industries. Higher education is one of them. That works for me. You look through find your current industry or your target industry. If you know that you want, you want to pivot, you know you're changing industries, I do recommend you put your preferred or target industry here, and then you'll make a case for it in your summary. Okay? You can only choose one. You can only choose one. Got to put a stake in the ground. But as we will discuss in a second, your summary is a great place to kind of show that you might be open to different paths. Okay? That's pretty tactical. All right, let's talk about summary, actually. Summary, you have 2,000 characters for your summary. This is the heart of your profile. I did a poll in January 2015, so it's like three years old now, but I pulled all of our top on-campus recruiters and talked to people who hired experienced hires. And I asked them questions about resume and LinkedIn. Time and time again, bless you, sorry. Time and time again, I heard that LinkedIn is now preferred over a resume. Resumes are still relevant, but they typically don't come into play until there's an actual job. You leave with your LinkedIn now. And what I heard from these recruiters is that a picture, they like the LinkedIn because you get to see a photo, right? You get a visual, you can't ask for a, at least in the US, you can't ask for a picture. So it's the picture and the summary. A good summary will keep people scrolling through your headline. Not many people have good summaries. Most people take like little objective statements or summary statements off their resume and cut and paste it. This is not a time to do that. The summary should be a first person optimized, right? If you're optimizing your LinkedIn, which is what we're talking about today, it should be a narrative about who you are, what you do well, what you're looking to do next and why. Those people in my earlier session today, we talked about this, right? You need to be able to position yourself. It's your positioning statement, okay? <coughs> and if you're not actively job seeking, you might say something like, you know, the work I love to do, or the work I want to do more of, um, or, you know, I'm ideally suited to, something that gives an idea about 
know, the direction you want to go. Right? Let's take a look at some summaries. Any questions on that before I dive in? No? All right, cool. So I'm going to start with Marshall Fox. This is someone I actually just worked with in the last two weeks, and he took my, um, I had a, and you'll get it on the alumni reunion website, but I did, I gave a hand out this morning about your career narrative, like what's your story, so maybe take a look at that too, it kind of fleshes it out. But this guy, he's an engineer, followed me to, followed it to the T. Let me just read his, his summary for you. Then we'll get some reactions and we'll get some different ones. So, who am I, what do I do well, and how have I added value? What am I looking for next and why? He's currently at McKinsey, and he's open. He said I could tell people. So he's looking for work in case anybody wants to talk to Marshall. I'll make the connection, and I'll take a fee. All right, I'm a strategy consultant at McKinsey who successfully advise senior clients in a wide variety of industries, including healthcare, electronics, and insurance. An engineer by training, I began my career solving elevator dispatching problems, deep sea robotics manufacturing challenges, and improving medical device reliability by working at numerous industrial companies. I bring expertise in digital transformation, manufacturing operations, organizational design, and strategy. Recently, here's an example, I built a five-year digital transformation roadmap for a large tools manufacturer that identified 300 million of run rate savings. I also successfully employed lean transformation methodologies at a large electronics manufacturer to reduce the cost of des desktop, desktop computer assembly by 30%. I find value in working with mission-driven organizations whose products have a positive impact on people's lives. Corporate social responsibility resonates strongly with me. While I bring a strong technical problem-solving skill set to my work, I'm at my best when I lead or contribute as part of a collaborative team with shared professional goals and values. All the numbers in the world are no substitute for having clients and colleagues who are willing to buy into the best path and move forward together. Anybody comment? Thoughts? Yeah, Antonio. One interesting thing I like about Barbara is a very human Yeah, the, the last paragraph, I agree, is the most compelling. It gives the most insight kind of into his personality and character. And, the, and what I say is, you know, it should be professional yet conversational in tone, and it should give the reader in, in, insight to your personality and character. We talked a lot about the verbal narrative this morning. This written narrative is somewhat the same, but it has to have, obviously, a, a more structured tone to it. And it should suit your, it should suit kind of your personality. It should feel authentic to you. Now, I will tell you, I have worked with people on Wall Street, and they're like, there, there's no way I'm doing a first person summary. And that's fine. I mean, that doesn't feel right to them. Don't do it. And let me just be clear, anything I tell you today, if this does not resonate with you, then don't do it. Your LinkedIn should be a genuine reflection of you, you as a professional, okay? There's no perfect summary, there's no right way to do it. I'm gonna show you a couple others, just so you can get an idea of some differences. So Reka is a 2006 grad, she's in the Bay Area. Here's hers. I've successfully helped high growth B2B and mobile commerce companies build their marketing function from scratch with a focus on product and revenue <laughs> architecture. My work transforms technical product features into concrete sales strategy that results in direct revenue. Currently as VP marketing at JumpShot, I'm building demand gen programs for our data insight products targeting three times ROI and one third of overall revenue. These programs are fueled by differentiated product positioning, product marketing, PR, data reports, and thought leadership. I'm an engineer at heart and am at my best when I'm driving revenues for innovative technical products. I hold a BS in computer science and engineering from UCLA and an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of, I should say management. I need to tell her, change that. And then, you know, she's got the, I, I actually wish I hadn't scrolled down so you saw that she's got the specialties. That people used to do that to like stuff keywords into their um, summary. Now the skills section has been created. We're gonna get to that too. So I don't, advise people to put keywords in their summary anymore, but um, that's hard. So a little shorter, a little more to the point, just a different way of looking at something. You wanna see a couple more? Yeah. All right, so now I'm gonna go to Nelson, who is an MD slash MBA. He's just got one big, he should actually break it out a little bit more, but you know, again, I'm not trying to go for perfection, I'm just showing different ways that people uh, present themselves. 
As a pediatric cardiologist and business executive, I focus my career on optimizing performance, <laughs> delivering value, and achieving desired outcomes. I bring 15 years of healthcare business and technology experience and I'm dedicated to being a change agent in how we deliver healthcare in the modern era. You should start a new paragraph now, but that's okay. I just want to say that. By leveraging my years of patient care, I can translate clinical workflows and healthcare challenges into business opportunities to meet the demands of the healthcare industry. My focus on systematic change and process-driven outcomes has been recognized, as well as my ability to educate and transfer knowledge effectively. I'm comfortable communicating with executives, clinicians, consumers, and large audiences. And he has a little paragraph about him personally. I serve on the board of directors for Blue Dragon Children's Foundation, a nonprofit that res rescues and improves the welfare of children. A little bit about him, you get a little bit of his, the flavor of what he is. He's not just a stodgy old MD, he's got a mission, right? And how he wants to use his MBA and blend to his medical background as well. Feel free to comment, share thoughts. I'll queue up one more. Yeah? So obviously, when you, when you first pull it up, it shows the first four lines. Uh, Correct. So obviously, that would drive how you would you know, highlight it, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I know. You know, People will tell you, like if you go and look at LinkedIn experts who are like LinkedIn whispers or whatever online, they'll say, you've got to make sure you grab them, and you grab attention and compel people to read it. Um, I guess theoretically that's true. I think you know one of the things I tried to get across in my earlier session today is you really want to be thoughtful about how you, like the story you want to tell. And so I don't think kind of making it flashy or whatever just for the sake of making it flashy is helpful. But it's not a bad idea, you know? Yeah. Yes? Is the summary more about once someone lands on you, really having a compelling version of yourself? Or is it critical in, um, I guess the search results are driven by the, the entirety of your profile and everything. So you don't have to, I guess I was thinking about how some of the wording sounds very common, like jargony or, mm. you know, and I'm just wondering how much having words that people would commonly be searching for, change agent yeah. or blah, blah, blah. I mean, I can okay. see wanting to use those words, but also wanting to stand out. So I guess I'm thinking about that. So you're thinking about what your question is. I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Yeah, I'm not like, sure I know my how do you balance? Like you're just noticing there seem to be buzzwords in there or keywords in there, and yeah. how do you think about that? So again, back to my first session, you can only control so much in this job in this job search in this LinkedIn game and how you're being found, whatever. And so I believe you should always start from a place of strength, position yourself with intention and purpose. That's really what we talked about. So I wouldn't be writing for who you think you want to read it. Think about your target audience, right? It could be recruiters, it could be investors, it could be clients. What's the story you want to tell about me? What's important for you to get across? <coughs> That's where I'd start. It's not that you can't tweak it once you realize nobody's looking at your profile, right? I mean, start somewhere. Start somewhere that's authentic and kind of genuine. That's the advice I give. If you then feel like you get some, you know, you get some feedback from people, you can really like jazz up the beginning. Try it, right? You can you can change this thing anytime you want, right? But I do think you should start not by thinking about what you should have down or what you think people want to hear, but you really want to think, and that's why there's so much groundwork and thought and self-reflection that goes into this, that's what we covered in the first session. So I don't want people to start going straight to LinkedIn. Does that make sense? If it, do, and if it doesn't, maybe watch the other webinar, because I really, this is really part two of what we talked about this morning. Yes? The argument Yeah, I mean, I think it again, it's what do you want people to know about you? What is most important to you? Um, it doesn't really go with the rest of his narrative, right? But if he has it in there, I guess it's important to him. I would definitely have it still in the volunteer and war piece of the profile. Yeah. It, it seems like there are two styles of these summaries. One is more punchy and, and readers digesty, uh, like the previous one. And some are more narrative. I'm going to take you through a story. It's yeah. going to be winding. Yes. What, what's more effective, or is it purely based off of who you're trying to reach out to? 
I think it's who you are. I mean, who is effect, what's effective? I don't know. I mean, it depends on the audience and what that person prefers, right? It's so individual. It's so personal. And that's why there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Um, I mean, let me show you another one. This is, I, I always go back to Michael Donahue. He's a, um, actually, Susan, was he in your class? No, Susan. Susan and I worked together for a couple years. I'm excited to see her here today. All right, let me read you Michael's. He's, I guess I am pulling up engineers. I don't mean to. I guess I gravitate towards this. But let me read him. Having grown up in startups, I've had the chance to play in every technical functional area from product development to manufacturing to purchasing. But the work I have found most professionally satisfying has lived at the nexus of people, process, and data. I think the capability to consistently improve is the critical factor that separates top companies from also rands. And I'm excited that I get to work in this area every day. I bring a deep technical, quantitative, and business background to my work, but I don't use numbers or data to beat anyone up. It took me the better part of a decade to understand that culture change is about respect for people, and the best analysis is useless if there isn't buy-in. I enjoy combining the challenge of identifying business-relevant insights and leading exceptional teams in highly technical and regulated industries. If it isn't difficult, why bother? I, lo I really like that one. He did it like five years ago. And I do not lie, he called me like a week or two later and said, I have gotten more pings from recruiters than I have in my whole entire career. And I really believe that was partly due to this summary. Not many people have a summary like that. It was compelling. It kept people scrolling. So that's what you want to aim for. There's really no like, what's going to be the most effective? What's going to get me the most views? Start from here. Start from what you, your leading strengths, what you need, what you want at this age and stage of your career, your priorities, your values. Right? Those are the things that go and lay the, that form the foundation and the basis of your, of your summary, of your narrative. We talked about a verbal narrative, you should have a verbal narrative too, but the written narrative is pretty much your LinkedIn summary. Any other questions about summaries, thoughts, reactions? Yeah? Yes. You made a comment earlier about um, having to select uh, like an industry that you're in, but if you're considering pivoting, the right. summary was the place to put something yes. like that. Yes, thank Can you. you. Give an example of yes. That? So if I want to pivot industries, or I want to put more, if I wish I could put more than one industry, where do I put that? So that would be in the, so I, I talked about the breakout. Who am I? What do I do well? What do I want to do next and why? It would be in that part. I'm looking for new challenges to leverage my expertise in finance and I'm considering either a fintech space or, I don't know, another space, right? And then you might put something else. You know, I actually, um, I had an alum I worked with who just took down his summary because he got a job. But at, let me just read you the last of his, the last paragraph of his because he's someone who was actively seeking and was open about it. So after five years of running my own design strategy practice, I'm ready to scale up my impact by joining a company that's growing quickly, has a strong team culture, and cares deeply about delighting its user, users. I'm actively seeking opportunities to leverage my expertise in design thinking, lean startup, or financial analysis. And I'd like to bring to bear my work ethic, curiosity, patience, and terrible puns to link arms and build something great. And another piece to this is some recruiter contacted him and said, I like terrible puns, too. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Nabil Lauji, if anybody remembers him, 2011. So he just got a great new job. So again, that, that resonated with somebody. They actually picked up on that. So that's where you could, as he had said, I'm looking at um, this, this, or this, right? It just kind of puts it out there. Yes? Did you just that when he got the job, he told Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he just made it super short, and he took out the part about how he was speaking. He didn't take away his summary. He just made it shorter. Yeah. Like, really short. Actually, I'm going to show it to you, because here, I guess this is another way you could do it. <clears throat> but it's super short now, guys. An MBA by trade, an anthropologist and educator at heart. I draw on design thinking and lean startup to help organizations uncover user needs and quickly develop products and services their users will love. Let's build something great. So, short and sweet. 
Again, it can change over time. If you just want it to reflect who you are, what you do well, what you want to do next in life. Okay? All right. Ooh, we'll move on from summary then. And actually, i got to catch up here with my um, terms. So moving on to the terms for an all-star profile. The other thing is a current position and two past positions. So actually, I'll just stay on his. Um, he has nothing under his newest job because he just joined two months ago before that. Nabil was an independent design strategist and his own firm for five years. Now this is long, but here's what we're going to do. Here's the thought process around the work experience. It should be, in my opinion, to optimize your LinkedIn profile, continue the storytelling in the first, in first person under your work experience. Right? Think of LinkedIn as a platform for telling a story. It's a lot more interesting to read if you can talk about, and I mean, isn't it easier to talk about yourself in first person too, right? Instead of like, led team of 10 to blah, blah, blah. You say, I worked with a high performing team that collaborated on something fun, you know? So think about the way you talk. So I'll just, this is the, I won't read all of this, but let me give you a flavor. Clients call me when they need to quickly skill up a, te up a team in design thinking, or when they need to stage a critical strategy session with their leadership and need a trusted hand to design and facilitate it. As a design strategist and coach, I've trained and developed hundreds of leaders across 15 companies in the principles of design thinking and business strategy, enabling teams to collaborate more effectively across silos, more deeply understand the needs of their users, and build products and services in a smarter way. I've had the opportunity to work with industry innovators such as Google, Cisco, Capital One, and Honeywell, in countries across the globe, in countries across around the globe, including Kuwait, Singapore, Canada, and India. Prior to design thinking, I did blah blah blah. I won't keep reading because I mean, do, so you get the flavor again. You're telling a story. It shows a little personality, has a little character, insight. That's what you want. Okay. So we, you want to have a current position and two past positions to meet the terms for a, a complete profile. The other piece around um, your work experience, if you can, link up with, I mentioned 20 million company pages on LinkedIn, link up with the logo. That nice visual logo makes it much more appealing. I can scroll down, I can see all the places that Nabil's worked very quickly. If I don't know anything about that company, I can click on the icon to find out about it so you don't have to waste valuable real estate in your profile explaining what your company does. That's a common thing people do. They spend all the time in the work experience section talking about their company. You should be talking about you and the results and the impact and the achievements and how you added value and how you contributed, right? Same thing for your resume, by the way. <laughs> so I always say to people, don't tell me what you did. Tell me what you did well. And I'll read a book, bullet, on a resume or I'll read something like this and I'll ask myself, so what? Right? You can say you did something. It doesn't mean that you were good at it. Right? So that's your work experience. And then I'll scroll on down to, and then the other thing is for those of you who are a little more senior and a little more seasoned, who might be thinking, I can't go back and rewrite in the first person something I did 25 years ago. I don't think it's as important to even have content on that stuff, unless it, unless it needs some explanation, unless it's a very obscure company and you want to clarify your role. Right? How many years would you go back? Somebody <laughs> I know. Can you somebody, somebody, Yeah, so now in LinkedIn there's this thing called being scrollable, right? You want it to, you want to kind of be able to scroll quickly. What they have done is at a certain point, actually he's still young, so he doesn't have the see more button like mine does. If you've got more jobs, right? You see you can click down and see more. So um, sorry, was your question around how many how far do I go back? Yeah. Or yeah. multiple or even at the years. Like some people I've seen yeah. Well, see, I believe you should put your years, but that's it. That's in, in work and in education, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, so the rule of thumb would be put in all your relevance to target. I guess that is the rule of thumb. Be relevant to target, but at the same time, you want to show chronological consistency. You don't want to just show like 10-year gaps without explaining. And then the other thing is like if you, after college, you know, if you took a gap year, or, you know, the gap year would before college. If you took a year and like were, was a CBOM, maybe you don't need to put that, right? But you do want to show from your gra your college graduation date kind of what you were doing. Make sense? Okay. 
All right, and then there was a, that actually um, <coughs> made me think of another thing. If you've been at a company for a long period of time and you've had multiple positions, right? So do you show the same company and keep entering data or do you put it all under one company? So it depends. Um, if your roles were ex like very different and you had a clearly defined set of responsibilities and achievements, then I would actually separate those roles. But if you were like a financial analyst and then a senior financial analyst and then the manager of financial analyst and the director of financial, like you could probably just put it all in one, right? And you could just say in it, you know, I began as, like at the end, you could say something like I, was, I began as financial analyst and was promoted progressively over 15 years or whatever. So it just should make sense for your situation. All right. Moving on. You guys are kind of a quiet group. I think it's the fact that it's 4 o'clock. <laughs> I, I, I'm not getting as many questions. We might get through everything. All right, let's go to education. I'll just stay on Nabil's uh, LinkedIn here. So, oh, he has his day school. All right. Interesting. <laughs> um, again, that might be relevant. I assume it's in New Jersey. But, uh, so, education as well. You want to have the nice, clean logo. I would go back and look at how you have MIT Sloan on your education because a lot of people have MIT or some people who get, like our LGO, who get both a master's in engineering and an MBA have those broken out separately because again, think about who might be looking for you. Would people be more likely to look at for MIT people or MIT Sloan or both? So you want to have that nice um, clean logo and then you want to have your years. Let me actually make a point about years too. Do not put months. When I, I want to go back to work experience. I just like the nice, clean years, right? It says one year, two year. Right? You don't have to put August 2006 to like February 2007. To me, I'm just all about cutting out the extraneous stuff. And it's just cleaner that way. And it makes you not have to think about when you actually left certain places. So um, <laughs> if you are part of activities or societies, you did anything, with your school, then you you might want to add something there as well. But if not, this is perfectly appropriate for education. Now, to the point about adding years, right? So pe some people don't want to give away their age and their stage, and they worry about ageism, and they think, why should I have it on there? So again, everything I tell you, you decide what's best for you. I have talked to many a recruiter who said they can't stand it when people are. It's a, it's a red flag for them if you don't put if you don't put it. Like then they think you have something to hide. Like own it, man. You're that. It, you're this is your edge, right? This is what you bring to the table. Think about it as being a more seasoned person with more to offer. I don't know if that kind of helps you do a mental um, acceptance of it. I do think it can hurt you actually if you don't put it. Right? I think it can be a red flag. Um, at some point, somebody's gonna have to meet you if you're looking for a job. So it's more about owning that story, again, going back to kind of laying that groundwork and leading from a place of strength. Okay? Yeah? So what about sabbaticals? Like, mm -hmm. you learn a current sabbatical. Yeah. Current position, you just open it all the time. Sure. Unless you're not supposed to be. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would say I'm taking a sabbatical so I can work on X, Y, and Z. A lot of our, so we have Sloan Fellows here who take a, a year off and they're not working. And so what I tell them is put a placeholder in their work experience for MIT Sloan Fellows and say, I'm taking a year to go work with colleagues from around the world and study innovation or strategy or leadership or whatever. Yeah. Be, so I, I guess what I'm saying here is be authentic, be transparent, be genuine. <coughs> yes. So this is on a uh, big screen, so maybe the recruiter will actually see it on a computer screen. But what, what if somebody is using like a mobile phone? How, how do you ensure that you know, you're you know, seen as <coughs> part of the narratives, maybe, maybe seem like a paragraph? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to scroll a little more with your thumb. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a good point. A lot of people use LinkedIn mobile. It's great for checking people out on the fly. Um, for you, I don't know that I would like design your summary for a mobile app. You know, I would really think about it as doing it this way, and then look at it on the mobile app. And if you find that you have to scroll too much, then you know, I better truncate it a little bit. So, 
All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Move on. Cool. All right, last thing, my least favorite thing to talk about is the skills piece. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with skills? Yeah, skills and endorsements. This is something that LinkedIn rolled out a few years ago because what they were trying to do in an effort to, of course, get people to pay them millions of dollars to use their tool, I have to be in my profile to show you this section. Um, they rolled out a, a section called skills and endorsements. Okay. And here's how this is supposed to work. So you pick your skills, your core competencies, the things you're good at, and you put them on your profile instead of stuffing them into your summary or other places where people were just doing like huge word dumps and blocks and stuffs of words, right? And then your connections can therefore endorse you for skills, which then means that you are more credible in that arena because you've been endorsed. Okay. So how many of you have skills on your profile and people have endorsed you for them, and you know they have absolutely no idea that you have that skill, right? <laughs> Everybody. So it's a game, and LinkedIn knows it's a game, and I talked to a LinkedIn product manager the same one who told me about the white collar workforce in the US being covered, and I was like, what's up with these endorsements, and stop popping up. You know they used to have, you might remember, anytime you logged onto LinkedIn, it would say, does this person have this skill? Does this person, it's so annoying. So they've taken that away, and they've kind of changed it. Um, but he said, you know, we're not taking it away. Like billions of door, like 15 billion endorsements have been given, plus it runs their talent solutions tool. It's part of that big old algorithm that gives them millions and millions of dollars. And I don't know if I said this at the beginning. 65% of LinkedIn's revenue, so that's two thirds of their revenue, comes from the talent solutions piece. So it comes from their clients. Did you have so, a yeah, question, Virgo? You know, so, do the actual recruiters use the skills and or it sounds like they do. I mean, basically the answer is if they're, if they're able to generate that much. Yeah, but they're not going in and looking. They have fields, so they have keywords, and the yeah. keywords pull from the skills section. Sure. Okay? Yeah. And from other parts of your profile. But so the, talking to a recruiter yourself, do they look at that section as something that's important to them? Or? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's funny. I have heard that some do. When, when I've done these workshops, some people have said to me, oh, I've been told that people are looking at who's recommending me and who's endorsing me. To me, that feels a little granular. Um, I know that the algorithm is not weighted on how many endorsements you have for your skill. You can have up to 99 endorsements for a skill. Um, at this point, anyway, it's not weighted. And I don't know how many people actually look at that, but I have been told, you know, for example, if, they, if someone within their company has endorsed you, they might, that might, they might, they're going to be alerted to that, so then they might go through and probe. I, I would just think about, again, controlling what you can control, think about those core competencies, adding them from there. Now, another piece to this is you can have up to 50 skills on your profile. I think that's like way too much. I would try and hone it down and curate your skill set, like 15 skills max, and then look at getting endorsements for those skills. But this is a game, this is also why I hate talking about this part, because people get so worried, like, I need to get more endorsements, or I need to have this. All I would do is go in, let me show you how to clean up your skill set. So I scroll down to my skills and endorsements section, and I'm gonna edit it. Well, first of all, if I wanna add a new skill, I think I have about 15, because I try and practice what I speak, what I preach. Now, based on my profile, it's gonna give me suggestions I can add, and you can see, you can add 38 more skills. So if you wanna add a skill, that's how you add a skill. I'm not taking the bait. So I'm going to go to edit. Now, I have, oh, I guess I only have 12. So here's the new, this just appeared too. The new way you're doing it is they're pinning your skills. So only the top three appear on your profile, and then you click in to see more. So I can choose which do I want pinned. If I don't want career counseling pinned, and I want to pin strategic planning, I can do that, and that will now appear. Okay, so for those of you who haven't looked at this in a while, this is new and you might want to, you might want to, you know, think about that. If I want to rearrange, reorder the, how they appear and I want strategic planning first, this is where I click and drag. Okay, then you go down and they've created these um, other buckets, industry knowledge, which doesn't really make sense, and interpersonal skills. I don't know when career development became an interpersonal skill, but that's okay. So this, sometimes it drives me nuts a little bit. So, but again, in these sections as well, you can reorder, 
So you can decide to pin something or you could just delete it. Okay, so that's what you want to do there. And the other piece to this is in the lower left hand corner, you have something called adjust endorsement settings. If you have any runway left on your career, I would just set these all to yes. I'll just tell you that right now. I mean, right now it says I want to be endorsed, even though there's, uh, you know, include me in endorsement suggestions to my connections. Show me suggestions to su endorse my connections. Like right now, some of these things aren't even active. I have seen something come up more lately. It'll say, um, if you had to go to strategic planning, which of these contacts would you pick? Has anybody seen something like that show up? Or I, you have? Okay, because I'm, I'm on it every day, so I see something new. But um, So now they are getting back into the game of trying to get you to endorse your connections. But anyway, that is way too much energy to spend on something that does not mean that much. But bottom line, curate your current skill set. Try and get it to like 15 that best represent you and the core competencies that you have and want to use moving forward. And remember with core competencies, I typically think about them in three buckets. There's skills you have, right? Data analysis, operations. There are, there's knowledge you have, um, distress debt. What else? Career management for me, right? And then there's attributes, so a little softer skills, but things like, um, Emotional intelligence. Actually, I don't know if you put that as a skill. Yeah, never mind. Don't do your traits or attributes. But think about your, your skills and your knowledge. Okay? All right. So that's the skills and endorsements piece. That is all you need for your all-star profile level. Okay? Now we're going to move on to the middle part of that checklist. These are things that I highly recommend that you include. Yes? Yes. I think that each week you have a resume of how, how many times you appear in research. On LinkedIn, is it this? If you uh, tick all those boxes, it is a way to hear more. And actually, is it correct being in all the, the research that you, that are made by uh, recruiters on, on LinkedIn? Is it worth being in searches? Is, is it, it worth being is it in? Relevant? Oh. Is, it relevant? is it relevant? So you don't know. You could be. So I think what you're saying is for everybody else is at the end, you'll get notifications to how many searches you appeared in in a week, okay? And so you're saying... If you are there, is it the good thing first? And how to, to be more, to, have a, to appear more? Okay, uh, right. okay so is it a good thing? Uh, maybe, unless, you, know, you, you don't know who's looking for you. It could be an ex-girlfriend, right? I don't know. <laughs> and then it could be a co it could be colleagues, it could be companies. So you have it, actually. You have a list of people that Sometimes you'll see who's been looking at you. Um, I, you know, I would think being, being coming up in searches is, you know, more, more of a good thing than a bad thing. Um, I don't think there's much more I can say to that. Unless you're up. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And, uh, if you want to be more, if you want to be seen more, make sure you've got your all-star profile level and these other things I'm about to cover. How about that? Yeah. All right. And then you want to use it. I'll talk about that at the end. How do you brand yourself? Okay. First thing, customize URL. This is hugely important. Actually, not a lot of people know about this. So to customize your LinkedIn URL, you'll come to, why is it not showing you? So I'm looking at mine, and it's actually hidden under this. There's going to be a link at the top right hand that says edit your public profile URL. Okay, so when you are, and I'm going to click on this. Let me explain the public profile, then I'll explain why this looks like this. So when you have a LinkedIn profile, you're automatically assigned a URL, and it says like linkedin.com slash in slash your name, and then it has a bunch of characters and letters. And you can actually customize it, as I've done here. To do that, you come here and edit it with up, up to five to 30 letters. And I just have my name, Bryn Penay Burkhart. Okay, so I've saved that. If you've got a common name, you might have to do, you know, Matthew Wilson 2 or Matthew Wilson whatever. Okay, so you might have to play around with it. It says you can't use symbols or special characters, but you actually can now. They started doing that because I think there's so many people creating them. You can use the dash now. So try and do that between your first and second name. All right, what this does is it creates a nice clean link that you can put on your resume. You do put your LinkedIn URL on your resume now. There's no need for a physical address anymore. It's just your email, your phone, and your LinkedIn URL because people are looking at your LinkedIn edition of your resume. Okay? Put it on your email signature. It's a nice invitation for someone to click in. Find out a little bit more about you. Okay? 
So this is this also doing this increases your search engine optimization. So when you're Googled, you're gonna have a better chance of having your LinkedIn profile come to the top of the search results. Okay, so doing that is just nice, clean, good LinkedIn practice. Okay, and then this whole public profile thing, I mean, this is like way back old school LinkedIn when they first, like 2008. And basically what they're saying here is, there are people who might log, like log in, to, not log in. It says, you control your profile and you can limit what's shown on search engines and other off LinkedIn services, which basically is anything that's not Microsoft. Viewers who aren't signed into LinkedIn will see this view. So you can come here, and you might want to spend some time after this, to, when you go in to edit your URL, looking here. So for <clears throat> someone who's not logged into LinkedIn, I don't have the content under my work experience. Right? I just kind of have what I've done in my education certifications. And I guess I do have that content there. But anyway, so you can control here on the right what you want shown public profile. Okay, so that's what that is. So customizing your URL, making sure your contact info is up to date. If you want to be contacted by people, we're going to talk about that in just a second, and how you're going to be leveraging your LinkedIn network and your network connections, you want to make sure that you have an active email. So for those of you who still have that Hotmail account when you created it in 2005, <laughs> update it, unless you're still using Hotmail, I guess. <laughs> no, I used to have a Hotmail account. All right, and so to edit it, it would be right here, right? See contact info, so you'd edit it. I'm not gonna jump into that section, because I think that's pretty self-explanatory. The other thing I wanted to point out, you might wanna leverage additional fields. So now if you look at the bottom part of that checklist, you'll see because LinkedIn's fastest growing demographic is students, 46 million students are on LinkedIn who have no work experience. So when you have no work experience, what do you do? You add other things. So under this accomplishments section, oh, can I show, yeah. So accomplishments, if you've been published, if you have patents, if you have certifications, if you've taken courses, test scores, nobody needs to put their test scores here. Uh, languages, right? If you're fluent in other languages, that's a great place to put it. Um, or other organizations, boards that you're on. This is, these um, <laughs> are great fields to fill out. Rule of thumb, as I said, relevance to target, right? You don't need to put 50 patents if you don't wanna be doing anything related to those patents anymore, okay? You might include it in your work experience, I would develop blah, 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 but you don't have to have this long laundry list. So relevance to target. So think about looking through those fields and picking the ones that are most relevant to you and then the other piece to recommend on your profile, um, use rich media if it shows your work. So now you can actually add slideshows, PowerPoint, YouTube, video. You know, it's nice visual portfolio of your work. So if you have relevant content that's really gonna bring what you've done to life, then consider embedding it. You can embed it in your summary or under your work experience. So, all right. That is profile. The only last thing I'll say, and then we'll dive into network management, is I would look at your privacy and settings because I know you're going to be making edits to your profile, and some people get nervous that things are going to get pushed out, right? People are going to say, so-and-so has a new summary, so-and-so has a new job, right? So to do that, you're going to go to settings and privacy, so you always start with this me tab. And I encourage you to take a look. This could be a whole class in and of itself, especially now with all these social media breaches. They like put in every single thing under the sun. So I would take some time to look at it. But I'm going to go to the Privacy tab here. And I'm going to go to How Others See Your LinkedIn Activity. And so this is where you want to just say, I do not want my profile edits shown. So it says, choose whether your network is notified about profile changes. So I would, I would put no. Right. Unless, you know, you're excited about kind of pushing that out, then you could say yes. So, but make sure your profile's in good shape, okay? Then you can turn it back on. There's a whole bevy of other things you could look at here, but I just wanted to point that out since we're talking about profile. All right, that ends the profile portion of today's discussion, and now I have a half hour to go over network management. Any last questions? Yes? 
Oh, actively seeking. Yes. Oh, that's in the that's in the checklist. So, what I recommend is if you are looking for a job, actively seeking. That is a word. That is what recruiters will look for when they're looking for like just in time talent. So, somewhere in your summary, probably in that last part, that last paragraph, what do I want to do next and why? I think Nabil used to have that in his summary that I'm actively seeking new opportunities to do in design thinking. And that's where that would go. Only necessary if you are looking for just-in-time opportunities. Okay. Yes. Oh, I was like, I was. I thought you were talking. I'm like, are you moving your words? Yes. <laughs> so good to see you too. Yeah. Recruiters know you're either open or not. Yeah. Unless you're in your forever job, you really want to always be open. Right. Does signaling it off really mean that, or do you say, okay, leave it on all the time? Not okay, are you, lawyer. yeah, are you talking about signaling it in your, in your profile? <coughs> oh, okay, yes, all right, so you got to that part. That was coming later in my session, that's all right. Um, so I didn't see, see that you already saw that. So, okay, yes, because I'm looking, you can see my private to me stuff. I'll go ahead and jump there real quick. On the job, on the job board tab, what LinkedIn has done is they've created something called the open candidate system. And what they're telling you can do, so you're gonna go here and edit career interests, <coughs> and it says, let recruiters know you're open. So what this means is, technically, technically, because they say, we take steps not to show your current company that you're open, but can't guarantee complete privacy. So technically, a recruiter could be looking, and if they're not from your company, you know, they could see that you're open to new opportunities. But you know, if you have third parties looking for search firms, then you could be seen. So if you are concerned about, um, you know, being being doing a confidential search, you might want to think twice about doing the open candidate system. However, if I scroll down. And show you this. So, what, what does it do that? Can you put it on and off? So, for those who are using the recruiter system, the talent solution system, they will, you will have a signal saying you're an op you're an open candidate, that you're open to opportunities. Now, is that bad? I don't know because look at this. When you scroll down, it'll say where are you in your search, right? And even I, I mean, I think I have. I mean, I just did it just to test it. I have. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I love my job, so no, no worries. Um, I have not looking but open to offers, because that's true. Someone can make me an offer. I want to know what my market value is, right? You could do actively applying, right? Or not open to offers. So, so to me, this is a nice safe thing that shows why, why not, right? If you got questions, you say, I went to a LinkedIn workshop, and this person told me to effectively manage my career, I should just put this setting, right? Other things you can do, like when would you like a new job? So let's look at this, as soon as possible, right? Maybe if you are concerned about a, a confidential or one to three months, four to 12 months, I have, I'm willing to wait for the right opportunity, right? Then you can fill out other things, such as your geographic location, what type of jobs you're open to, what industries you prefer, what size companies you'd like to work for. You can save it, you can turn it on or off. So, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I get, I mean, I, like, LinkedIn can be sloppy sometimes, so I don't know that I completely, and they, and they, obviously, they've got their disclaimer here, like, we're going to try not to keep you, you know, we're going to try to keep confidential, we can't, can't, um, guarantee it, but I think it is a, new, a feature you should be aware of, right, as someone who's going to be using LinkedIn for career management. How do you get to that? Jobs. Job. Jobs. Yep, you hit your jobs. Okay, any other, I'll take a couple. Yes, yeah. you, who I thought was talking the first time, yeah. Um, so how do you know that you have no soft profiles? I mean, you have these six or seven things that you have to kind of fill in, but yeah. then you know, once I've done that, I got Yes, yeah. so again, I actually I think we're Nabil, uh, no, sorry, you're not Nabil, um, <laughs> where I think you saw it on my dashboard, I've got all start right here, uh, yeah. So you might see expert, or you might see intermediate, or you might see beginner, I think those are the four um, stages. So you're on, I'm on my profile. I'm logged in as me and I'm on my profile. When you're logged in as you, see, you see this is private to me. You should not be seeing this data, but anyway. 
Yeah, so Fun. I'll start. Okay? All right, yes. Do one more. Question. Um, I noticed someone did a recommendation. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Right. So you can set who sees recommendations that you receive or that you give. Okay. Do you need recommendations? Is that your question? Well, oh. They voluntarily put it on. Should I be concerned? I won't read it. Here's my rule of thumb around recommendations. So if it's specific to you, and it's a really good recommendation from someone who matters, someone who you manage you, then you could put it on. I do not think anybody at this age and stage of their career who's here at Reunion, I mean, maybe if you're only a, a year or two out, needs to go actively seeking recommendations. So um, if it's relevant, if it's specific to you, and it's not amb ambiguous, they actually used to have, to be an all-star, you used to have to have like two recommendations, and they took that requirement away because then it was just a game again, just kind of like this, the skills where people were writing, you know, meaningless recommendations. Okay. Yes, I'll do one more. <gasps> okay, so close. Yeah. I'm gonna get to I'm gonna get to premium. I have a slide on premium, so I'll show you. Okay? I really want to talk about network because we have talked about how to optimize your profile. Now I want to talk about how to optimize your network, right? So that it best works for you. So all right. What I'm gonna have you do here is not now, but <laughs> what I want you to do when you leave here, rather I should say, is look at your current network. How many of you have about five, at least 500 contacts? All right, so a lot of people, okay. Um, I'm willing to bet if you look through all those contacts, which I want you to do after you leave here today, I want you to look at all your thousands of contacts, because some of you may have thousands. I am willing to bet that there will be people in there and you have no clue who they are, <laughs> right? Right, and so my belief is that you should only connect with people that you know and that you trust quality over quantity. There are different schools of thought on this. There are people who preach LinkedIn, open networkers, they're called lions, by the way, there's a club. Get as many contacts as you can, right? But in order to effectively leverage your network for your benefit, you are gonna be far better off if you're only connected to people that you know and trust. So I will say that trust piece is important, and here's why. All right, so here's the deal. If you, are, if you know everyone and trust everyone in your first degree network, then you are better able to leverage their network, which is your, called your second degree connections. These are the people you have the potential to meet. All right? So I have like 500 connections. But I always, every time I get to 500, I go and clean it up a little bit. So I think I'm at like 501. Actually, I'm going to look. So network. Look at that, 501. OK? So when I get to 500, I go back and clean them up. And here's why. I have 500 connections. I have 465,000 second degree connections. But my ability to tap into those people is only as strong as our mutual connection. Okay? My ability to leverage them. And I believe second degree connections can actually, in some cases, be more effective and more powerful than first degree connections because if you're able to tee up a nice warm introduction, you're going to be talking to someone who doesn't know anything about you and has no preconceived notions about what you can do or any opinions about what you can and can't do, rather, right? Your first degree connections have, you know, have ideas about what your, your abilities and your strengths are. Your second degree connections have a nice referral, but the, clay, the slate is clean, right? So you really want to be able to tap those second degree connections. So I employ the favor test. I think you should ask yourself, if you get an invitation, do I know and trust this person and would I be willing to tee up an introduction to, my, to someone in my network for this person? And would I be comfortable going to this person and saying, hey, I want to meet someone in your network? And if the answer is yes, then connect with them. And if the answer is no, I would say, I don't know that's worth it. Okay? So, the first thing, like I said, I'm going to recommend you go in and you clean this up. Let me just show you. And Again, this workshop used to be so much more robust. Now they are pushing premium and they're taking away features. So I used, used to be, be able to do all these beautiful things with your connections. Now, you can really only sort them by recently added first name, last name, although you can search for people. You could go through this list, scroll, scroll, and if you didn't like someone, 
you could click the three loop, the three dots and then remove them, but that's a little hard. You could search with filters. You can search with some filters now. That was just added in January. You do not get a link, a uh, delinked, you've been delinked notice, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can search on some filters, but I would go ahead and download a, a file. And so to do that, it's, you can download a CSV file, again, in Privacy and Settings. You're going to go to Privacy. You're going to go to How LinkedIn Uses Your Data. You're going to download your data. Here's the thing, though. You can get the works, which is every single thing, or for the purposes of this exercise, I would just pick and choose your connections. And then they'll give you, they'll send you an archive of your data. It's a CSV file. I wish it had more info in it than it did. So if you want more info, you should pick the works. But basically it comes, I just did it this week, so I knew what it was going to show. First name, last name, company, title. It does not show location, which is kind of a bummer. Okay, but that's how you're going to get your file. And then I would go back and I would clean up your connections that way. That's really the optimal way to do it, especially if you've got thousands and thousands. Right? Now, scrubbing your connections like this, let me go back to my network management. Only connect with people you know and trust. Look at your connections. Download your connections. You're going to probably remember, like, why am I connected to this guy I used to work with and didn't like, and I am not connected to, like, my best friend who I used to work with, right? So you're going to think about people that you're not connected to that you want to reach out to. Remember those four buckets, friends and family, shared work experiences, volunteer community connections, and alumni. Look, you'll probably be connecting with some people here after this weekend, right? So when you do that, make sure, always, good principle, send them the at. You, you now have a feature called add a note. So if I want to connect with somebody, you can tee up and add a personal note, right? Going back again to the relationship piece of it. Businesses are built on relationship, careers are, careers are built on relationships, so make the time to engage with people when you're asking them to connect with you, okay? So check in with them, maybe you could say, hey, haven't talked to you for a while, attended this LinkedIn session, cleaning up my profile, would you endorse me for all my skills? And I'll, I'll endorse you back. So there's maybe a nice way that you can engage with people. All right, I've got a lot of questions coming up. Let me start here. So yeah. One, what if your boss wants to do an attribute? Is that weird and accepted because you might be seen in who they be in or it's more weird to reject them? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Thank you. Next, no. Do you know and trust them? Does it make sense for you professionally? I, gr I agree to your point. Um, and it's not like they're going to be looking at your profile every day. Like, So remember, you, yeah, you yeah, don't have to. Part two was, uh, what about adding no and trust. No and trust. Recruiters want to connect with everybody and anybody because they're going to look at your, your contacts. So connecting with a recruiter is not going to benefit you unless you know that recruiter. Okay? Uh, so that's something here. Yeah, so, so I'd, I'd like to expand on this first question. So I mean, you get a, you get a, you, you go to a, a business function, you pass out your card or something, you get home and you get a LinkedIn request for Yeah. You don't even know anything about it. The, what, what are the implications of either rejecting, letting it sit there, what do you do? About yeah, I mean, so it, I mean, so here's another thing. Sometimes I'll accept those, but then I clean them up later, like when I hit my 500, <laughs> right? Like we have temps who are in and out of our office every year. Like sometimes, you know, and I, I of course, if they're working in our office for a time, I'll accept it, then I clean it up. Um, I, in my network, I prob, I just kind of ignore them. I have a lot of, I was, I don't even know where to show, but I just, I kind of. So you just, just let them sit. I do. Okay. Yeah. If that's right for you, though, I, mean, like, I just, sometimes I get us. Yes? Does add a note work with mobile yet? It does. Oh you God. can personalize your invitation via mobile phone. I knew somebody was going to ask me, so I made sure to have the directions. There are three dots in a box at the top. Click the three dots, and it will say personalized invite. I'm so glad you asked because I... Yes, I made sure to make that point because you should be personalizing your invitations when you can. It's lazy and sloppy. Okay. That, that was a little strong, sorry. <laughs> Not that you're lazy and strong. You know, it's just, again, you want to be practicing good networking principles, right? You want to take time and put effort into the connections you want to maintain. So part of that is being personal. Yes. And then, As I'm going through, I'm noticing some people, Yeah. <laughs> 
<gasps> do you mean should you put MBA next to your profile? I mean, I, I don't know that you need to, but maybe, maybe some people want to do that. That's important to them. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go back to my network <coughs> and then connection. So um, let's talk about, let's move on because we've got, oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. Every year, we got to make this a two hour session, guys. All right. Expanding your network. I want to show you quick ways to look at your second degree connections. Okay. So. I, I, I'm in network, my, my first degree network, and I'm going to filter it because you can filter on different things. As you see right now, I'm, I've got my first degree connections filtered. Let's say I just want to look at my second degree connections, all right? Oh, I thought I had a lot more than that, but that's okay. Still, 369, that's not bad. All right, now let's say, you know, I really want to leverage my network. I want to get to some decision makers. Who's that CEO in their title? And just to get another layer in that, you know, we could look at a location, or we could look at companies, or we could look at industries. Um, so I'll pick, I'll pick like the internet industry. Let's see what that does. So now I'm at 1,400 people that I'm a second degree connection to, who is maybe a CEO or used to be a CEO because everything is indexable and searchable on LinkedIn. And now I could say, you know, let's take a look at Rob. So Rob is a second degree connection. I want to see, I can see here, I've got a mutual connection here. Actually, I know I have more than that. There's a messaging window that's always going to be on the side. And you just pop, you just hit it to pop up when you're on a desktop. And it's going to tell me that I have three connections to Rob. David, Jeff, and Liz. So if I want to get the introduction, because I know all three of those people and I feel comfortable asking them to introduce me to Rob, I could just click on David's and write him a note, write him a message. David, would you be so kind as to introduce me to Rob or tee up an intro? The better way to do it, though, guys, is take it out of LinkedIn. Go to David's profile, get his email, email him directly. Because not everybody checks their LinkedIn or their LinkedIn messaging. And they want to push you to this, and I do want to show you it because it's important. But I would actually go to the <clears throat> connection and get the email and do it that way, okay? So that's how you can do some playing around with your first degree connections. You can filter on anything. You can say, who are my first degree, my second degree connections, rather, in you know, Boston who work in a certain industry, right? That's how you can get some traction if you're really targeting a job search. Okay. Whenever you're asking a favor, you want to offer to do a favor. So if you're saying, would you be so kind as to tee up an introduction, you also say, and if I can never be of help to you, don't hesitate to ask. That's good networking, right? And there's actually a really good article. Um, it's on the muse.com, muse, M-U-S-E, if any of you have ever seen it. It's a career website. And um, it's called 28 Email Templates for 2018. And I really like it because it gives you like any, any situation under the sun. Like how to ask for an intro via email, how to text an intro, how to, how to send a follow-up email after a job interview. So it's a, it's a nice thing to look at for inspiration. I mean, I don't think they're perfect. Do not cut and paste it. Add your own, add your own um, you know, personality into it. But it, for people who want to know, who really want some help, how do I send this? Okay? So that's second degree connections when you're doing kind of a people search. Now I want to show you that fantastic alumni tool I mentioned earlier. So here's what you're going to do. Again, I wish LinkedIn made this easier. It used to be a lot easier, but Microsoft, I tell you. Does anybody work for Microsoft? Right. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to write MIT Sloan in the menu bar, OK? And I'm going to have you hit Enter, because I'll tell you that in a second. And then what you're going to do, oh, Go away. Is you're gonna go to more and you're gonna hit schools. The reason I have you do this is because when you hit MIT Sloan and you pick one of those drop downs, sometimes you might get the MIT Sloan company page. And I want to make sure you get to the school page, which is why you're gonna select schools. Okay? So, MIT Sloan schools. I get six results. Obviously, I only want MIT Sloan. All right. So this is the MIT Sloan school page. As you can see here, it says there's 27,439 plus alumni. 
If I click on this button, see alumni, I can now look at the 27,547 people who have MIT Sloan under their education section. And as I always say, most of them went here. <laughs> Some people have done an exec ed course and stuffed this under their profile. So you know, you kind of just need to know that when you're looking at it, you look at the degree program. But I can now slice and dice them by where they live, where they work, or what they do. So let's do my same test. I want to see who's got CEO as a keyword in the profile. 3,903. Someone give me a location. Oh dear God. <laughs> All right, so for that, I have to click the ad. <laughs> I, actually, my husband's from Korea. I, I, I should have had that reaction. Eight. Eight people with CEO in their profile. And if I scroll down, I can see them. So now here's eight, eight people. Um, they might not all be CEOs. They might have worked with CEOs or formerly been a CEO. But now I can actually see these eight people. And what I was hoping to show you is that I would have a second degree connection. And then I could say, you know, that would be an easier way to get in touch with them. I know none of these people, so this would be kind of a cold introduction, which you can use. You can use LinkedIn's in-mail system to reach out to people. Right? Or you can try and find someone else within the company. Okay? But that is, that's how you look. And you can do this with a ton of things. Like, I've had... People get traction in a job search. One of my favorite stories is I had an alum I worked with once who was dying to work at SpaceX, couldn't find you know, a way into SpaceX because he was applying on job boards, which is not how you're going to get a job at this point in your career. And you know, now there's seven alums. <coughs> Where are they? Right? So at the time, there, were only, there was only one. It was Peter Capazzoli. And he took a, <coughs> um, a cold email from this kid and teed up an informational with him, and he ended up going out for an interview. He did not get the job, but still. Can't promise you the job, but you can get <laughs> connected there, right? So you can use this for companies as well, because the Where They Work button only pulls from where they currently work. As you see, I put in SpaceX in, in the search bar. Right now, there's only three people who act to actually work there. So other people used to formerly work there, OK? So this tool is awesome. It's great for you know, career research. It's great for, obviously, networking, job hunting. Okay? So those are the two best ways to get into your second degree connections. And those are the most effective connections when you're really thinking about your network. I have three more minutes. I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do. We talked a little bit about the job piece. I don't think I'm going to go that much into research. <laughs> Premium. Yeah. So, so let me just fly through these slides then, right? I do want you to think about using LinkedIn to do like looking at anybody. So I showed you people search. <clears throat> you don't have to just be looking at your connections. I've had people who want to be product managers at Google, so we go and we look at product managers at Google's profiles, and we find out where did they work before they worked at Google, and where did they go to school, what were their degrees, and what organizations. So great, what can we get intel? Um, company pages, we won't look at them, but follow any company you might be interested in working for. That's the bottom line there. Um, use it to expand your company list, and then I was going to show you the, the job board. Um, I, this is kind of how to brand yourself, and then let me get to my premium slide. All right. So here are the main reasons people will get premium, right? To do sales leads, funding, and companies will pay for you to get premium. The advantages. To see who, you, who has viewed your profile. I have premium. Sloan pays for everyone in our office who does advising to have premium because we look at profiles all the time. So, you know, I can then see who's viewed my profile. And sometimes that ni that's nice, especially if you're in a job search. You know if you're getting some traction. If you put out some emails, <coughs> um, that, that can help. So it says, oh, I was going to see who's viewed my profile. Yeah, let me just look at these people. Okay, so I can kind of see, you know, like today, people are looking at my profile because I'm teaching these sessions. So I can see all my profile views unless the people have themselves anonymous, like this person. You can be anonymous, you can be semi-anonymous, so I know it's someone at Sloan, but I don't know who, right? Or you can just be like full Monty. 
I suggest just be open, you know, unless I actually, there is someone who got a job that way. Two years ago, an MBA got a job that way. Because someone saw that she looked at the person and he looked at her and he, <laughs> and it, you know what I mean? It, it worked out. Okay, so see who viewed your profile. If you don't have a premium membership member, you cannot see who's viewed your profile, okay? Or you can only see up to like seven days. And with premium, you can see 90 days. The other big benefit, you can look as many profiles as you want with a premium membership. Now what LinkedIn has done in an effort to push you to premium is they told at some point you get blocked from looking at profiles. You hit a, a commercial use limit and they don't tell you the number. They just say, you hit your limit for the month and then it resets the next month. So if you really want to use LinkedIn, um, you might want to do that. You can also send those in mails. That's if you don't have an email for someone and you're cold reaching out to them. You're reaching out to them in the cold. And then finally, there are some increased search capabilities. So the job board, you're going to have more filters. When you're looking at company pages, you're going to see more insights. I would not do premium until your LinkedIn is in good shape and it's ready to go. And then you take advantage of the free one month you get and use as much as you can and see if it's worth it. And then you can continue. Okay, That's what I would do. I am sorry that we came to the end of this session. I hope you found it somewhat helpful. There will, it will be online if you want to look at everything again. Please consider joining me tomorrow at Speed Networking. It's a great chance for you to practice your career narrative, your verbal career narrative. And I appreciate your being here. Have a great time at the Thanks.